<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is part of the great stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Raj Sekar Mohapatra with us today. Hello, Raj Sekar. Hi. How are you? I'm doing awesome on this May 7th, 2024, as we record this one. And uh, Raj Sekar, where are you located at? What's your geolocation? So right now I am at uh, Oxford. I'm visiting Oxford University for a few weeks, but in general, I'm at Princeton in the U.S. Very nice. Very nice. Are you a postdoc there? Yeah, I'm a postdoc at Princeton, and I work primarily with Elliot Cortet there, mm -hmm. who is a professor at Princeton. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Very nice. Uh, and Raj Sakar, what do you like to do for research? Right. I... I like things uh, related to galaxy clusters, especially in the central regions where we have these big, massive elliptical galaxies. And I like to look at how the gas in that is heated, how it is cooled, what are the different heating elements there, how does cold and hot gas exist there, all of these sort of things. Nice, so. beautiful, beautiful. And that is gonna bring us to this very awesome APJ article. It is open access. It's the open access era, people. You can go get a copy for free. Go grab one. Multiphase gas in elliptical galaxies, the role of type 1a supernovae, and Raj Sakar, take us away. Thank you, Frank, again uh, for yeah, letting me talk about this. And uh, I would like to thank Elliot, who helped improve this article a lot to well, his mentoring and constantly telling me about yeah, how we can increase the scope and make this article better. In addition to that, I also want to thank uh, Ming Hao uh, Guo, who is a graduate student with Elliot, and he helped me set up the simulations in the beginning, cool. and Patrick Mull Mullen and Jim Stone, uh, who also helped write um, Athena and the GPU version of it, which we are using here. So yeah, shout out to all of them for their help in bringing this article uh, into its form. Yeah. Good shout and, out. Yeah. Good shout out. Yeah. yeah, right. And uh, right, so coming into this article, uh, here we are talking about uh, multiphase gas in elliptical galaxies and what role type 1a supernovae can play there. Okay. Right. So, right, uh, compared to, you know, the standard galaxy picture we are used to, uh, elliptical galaxies are like super old, they have, uh, a yeah. lot of hot gas in the ISM. There's not much neutral or, uh, you know, uh, atomic or uh, molecular gas in that. Uh, the ISM is predominantly hot with temperatures you can see between 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 7. Yeah. Number densities of uh, like one particle per 100 centimeter cube or like a particle per centimeter cube in the densest regions. But despite all of this, the uh, gas in this uh, ISM can cool in less than a giga year. Whereas we know that the systems are stable for much longer than a giga year. So the, even though they can uh, cool down by basically emitting X-rays, they can, in a giga year, they're still uh, you know, not showing uh, that. So that means something is, uh, something is heating the ISM of these galaxies, which is exactly uh, yeah, what has been, uh, yeah, which is something people have been discussing about and there are like a bunch of different sources of heating uh, these elliptical galaxies. One, if we start from larger scales to smaller scales, okay. you can think about mergers, one after the other, galaxy mergers, which you know elliptical galaxies form towards the end of the uh, hierarchical galaxy merger formation. Uh, and those shocks can heat ties, uh, heat keep these hot. Then we also have uh, active galactic nuclei. So, you know, the AG and jets coming out from the supermassive black holes at the center of these galaxies. These galaxies are huge. So the central black holes have like 10 to the power nine solar masses. So AGN is one very attractive scenario. But in this one, we are talking about type 1a supernovae, which are very common in old stellar populations. So because the stellar population is quite old, we don't have as many type twos, but we have a lot of type 1as. And now I think I'll, we can take this opportunity to jump to figure one. Sure. Uh, so let's yes, which is just in the next page. And there we go. So radio profiles. There we go. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
thanks. Yeah, so here I'm showing uh, typical uh, density, stellar mass, uh, gas density, stellar mass density, and entropy profiles normalized to some standard values in the central 10 kiloparsecs of an elliptical galaxy. Uh -huh. Now, if I now, if I use this density temperature uh, and calculate the cooling rate based on, let's say, uh, some metallicity values uh, that I assume, I think here it was 0.5 solar, then I get some cooling rate, which is that pink curve you see in the bottom panel. Okay. So that's the total cooling rate. Now, for a given stellar density and stellar age, I can also estimate what's the type 1a rate. So at what rate... Uh, the type one is supernova are happening. These are constrained by delay time distribution plots of uh, type one is supernovae in observation. So if I know the type one a rate and I assume that each uh, supernova event is giving me 10 to the power 51 ergs of energy, yeah. then I can calculate a heating rate from that. Yeah. So, so we have the stellar density and then we know how many supernovae are going up. So we have a mm -hmm. supernova density and then each supernova has some energy so right. from that, we get a heating rate due to supernovae. So oh. that gives us the dotted line, which is marked as E dot SN in the bottom panel. Mm -hmm. And we see that they show a very remarkable match across you know, the central 100 parsecs to up to 10 kiloparsecs between the heating and cooling rates. How interesting. So yeah, this is something that was very interesting to us. And this is not just for one electrical galaxy. We tested this out for known profiles of... Uh, uh, a bunch of different uh, elliptical galaxies. Many of these profiles are published in uh, some observational papers by Norbert Werner back in 2012 and 2014. Uh, yeah. And then that was sort of our source of inspiration to see whether how the supernovae are actually playing a role, especially in the central tens of kiloparsecs. Now, one interesting thing about supernovae is, you know, they are not just putting their heat directly in the ISM. But uh, there is also, uh, they're also driving, uh, putting in momentum, yes. which means they're driving motions in the gas. Yes. Now, when they're, when the supernovae are going off and interacting with each other, they, they will drive some shocks and these shocks will interact with each other and they can generate high density regions, low density regions. Yes. So all of these things. Cool. I'm right. mm -hmm. Then, so uh, in these kind of conditions, what can happen is, uh, uh, right. Uh, now, based on that, I'll actually go back to the introduction and uh, also bring a short discussion on when uh, we can have multi-phase gas in these uh, in these scenarios. So yes. if you just look at the uh, last paragraph on the right side here. So, yeah. right. Yes. Now, uh, even though if we can have a heating and cooling balance <laughs> system, uh, if, if we have motions in this, uh, uh, in the system. So we have some dense regions and some rare regions. Now the dense regions will try to cool very fast because the cooling rate is proportional to the density square. Okay. Whereas uh, the heating doesn't depend on the density square. So the dense regions will always try to cool faster and the rarer regions will cool slower. So okay. what can happen is in some regions, your, our gas will start cooling and clumping and that can sort of lead to the gas cooling down all the way to 10 to the power 4 yeah. Kelvin when it started at 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So supernovae, by driving shocks in the ISM, and when the shocks sort of interact, they will create these sort of dense regions. So one of the things that we discuss in these papers is how uh, the supernovae are driving these fluctuations and whether they can lead to cold gas formation. Oh. Now, one of the interesting parameters here that we can look at is uh, the thermal instability time to the free fall time ratio, which is mm -hmm. uh, which is something proposed uh, around 10 years ago by Pratik Sharma. Uh, and uh, there is also Prakriti Paul Chaudhary's work uh, on that. And then we will also talk about uh, the turbulent, the thermal instability time scale, which is related to the cooling time of the gas and the mixing time scale due to turbulence. Yes. So this was something proposed by Max Gaspari, who was a also a former postdoc at Princeton a few years okay. ago. Okay. So the supernovae uh, actually can also drive turbulence in the ISM, and that can play a role in deciding what's the turbulent mixing time. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I, I will introduce these timescales in a bit more detail as we go further down in the paper. Uh, 
uh, and I have myself also done some previous work on uh, how these different time scales play a role in determining when and how cold gas can form yes. uh, through thermal instability from the hot place. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I'm with you. Right, right. So now, uh, yeah, I think we can go down a bit uh, to figure three to show what is something uh, unique about uh, this paper. Uh, yeah. that was not done as much in, uh, I guess, uh, previous studies. So yeah, yeah, figure three, this is something actually quite simple. Uh, here I'm showing slices of density around a region where we have just injected a supernova. Okay. Now, okay. The density is in log scale uh, and uh, we have gravity facing uh, downward in the Z direction. Okay. So if we overheat a small region of the ISM, Yes. That basically starts rising up against gravity. It's similar to when you inject an air bubble in water and the air bubble rises up because yes. it is buoyant, right? Because the density of air is much less than the density of uh, the water around it. Good so, enough. exactly. So, uh, when this bubble rises up, uh, it also undergoes, uh, in, there are also instabilities associated with it. You may know of the Rayleigh Taylor instability, which Perfect. is when you have a rarer medium below and a denser medium up. And even though they're in pressure balance, if you perturb the system, they start developing these eddies and that's how the uh, they were different rarer and uh, denser fluids mix. So that is exactly what is happening here. Uh, mm -hmm. With time, we see this low density region, which was, uh, which is, it's basically a bubble uh, inflated by energy uh, injected into it by the supernova. And oh. then it's sort of rising and mixing over around 50 million years. It has almost completely fixed to the ISM. Another interesting thing we can see is if we look at the leftmost panel around uh, Z equal to 0.3, we see the sound wave front. Uh, yes, so you can see this sort of a circular feature there. We'll see that more in... Uh, yeah. in yeah. So the, the supernovae also drive here, many sound waves that sort of pervade the medium. Uh, it's basically oh, okay. when we okay. inject them, they sort of expand. And then once the average energy of the supernova equals the average energy of the ISM, then they sort of reach a pressure equilibrium and the sound wave sort of detaches and moves away. So okay. that's what is happening here. Cool. Very now, good. Now, uh, a third interesting thing, uh, particular to the ISM of elliptical galaxies, is that uh, in these systems, uh, because the gas density is so low, much lower than the disk of regular uh, you know, spiral galaxies or disk galaxies, is that the density is much lower. So right. uh, our supernovae uh, start from you know, a point source of energy almost, and then they expand. And they never accumulate enough matter in the shell Shelf. to go into the momentum-driven phase. So generally, when we model supernovae, we have an energy-driven phase, then momentum-driven, then fade away. Right. So in this case, we will never enter the momentum-driven phase. So yes. it's basically we conserve, conserve energy, and then at some point, the average energy inside the supernovae will equal how much is there outside, yeah. and then we'll have fade away. So... This is just because the density is very low, and that makes it much easier for us to model the supernovae in the sense we can just choose a spherical region around yeah. what our injection site is and just put in the power 51 in a arcs of energy there, and we don't have to worry about the momentum injection. Yes. Uh, cool. Because we are never in the momentum conserving phase, we are always in the energy conserving phase. Cool. So that makes it easier to model in the simulations. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, now, I guess we can move on to what our model is. So let's go to, I guess, uh, our, yes, our uh, uh, section three, where we talk about methods, model equations, and the problem setup. Okay. Let me get there. One sec. Sorry. Uh, about three methods. Here we go. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so just a quick look at the equations. We have uh, the uh, you know, the, we have the standard Euler equations with some extra source terms. So the IS, we are modeling the ISM as an ideal gas. These are all hydrodynamics. Now we can see in the equation 3A, we are having uh, mass injection due to supernovae and also due to AGB stars. Uh, that's something I 
I haven't done in all the simulation, but something I'll discuss in the appendix. So we'll keep it for later. And in the space in 3B, we can see that we have a source term due to gravity on the right hand side. Uh -huh. So there is rho G. Then in the energy equation, we have the gravity term. Uh, then we have the supernovae, the AGB stars, and then there's some idealized heating model that we also use. I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then we okay. have the radiative cooling uh, of the gas. Very good. Now, now, throughout this paper, I'll be comparing between two different kinds of heating. One is due to supernovae. And okay. another is a very idealized heating, which has a similar distribution in space as the as the supernova heating, just that it's uniformly spread instead of being chunked into supernovae. So let's say I look at a patch of the ISM and I know what's the supernova heating rate in this. Now, okay. if I am injecting that as supernova, then what I'll do is I'll put them in different points yes. at some specific rate. So I have some... Let's say I calculate some supernova rate and I inject the energy into these balls, uh, yes. which are the supernova bubbles. Another way I could do it is I just put the uniformly spread out the energy after once I know the stellar distribution function. What's the star distribution? Depending right. on that, I know what the supernova energy distribution is. And then I just spread the energy uniformly. Now, the issue with spreading the energy uniformly is I may not get as much momentum injection because the supernovae, they're Yes. going to overheat region so they will expand and interact with each other whereas this uh, uh, the other method won't have these interactions it's just a smooth heating term so right. we are also comparing uh, the smooth heating which is which Good. is often done when people cannot resolve the supernovae in big simulations yeah. versus when we do the supernova heating term okay okay cool. now we can go to the problem setup uh, which is uh, which is basically telling us what we are doing. Now, mm -hmm. imagine we have this huge elliptical galaxy and okay. we take a small rectangular region, slight, some, uh, somewhat offset from it, such that we can assume that gravity is towards the center. Okay. So we have, this is a big sphere, let's say, and we have taken a tiny region of a kiloparsec cube in size. Okay. And then so gravity is pointing this way. And we have some density density is decreasing outward because the density is highest in the center of the elliptical galaxy and it decreases outward. And pressure is also decreasing outward. So, and we assume that this tiny chunk that we have taken has like constant temperature. Okay, so that's sort of a starting model. Okay. Uh, so we are take and we assume that these have scale heights of h. So you see that our pressure and density have exponential forms. So we are assuming a small region in an elliptical galaxy is ISM, and we have gravity in negative z direction okay. and uh, exponential profiles in density oh, and pressure. I'm with you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what we do is uh, we know once we have the density and temperature, we know what's the cooling rate of this gas, uh, assuming some, we assume that it's 0.5 solar metallicity everywhere. And then okay. what we do okay. is okay. we already have some motivation to see that the energy injected due to supernovae matches with the cooling rate at mm -hmm. the different red eyes. So what we do is uh, we say, okay, so if the scale height of uh, uh, density is H, then we'll set the scale height of supernova to be such that the supernova heating rate is matching the cooling at all different Z. So we yeah. have like, we yeah. have a box like this. So what we do is we set the total heating uh, of the supernovae to be equal to the total cooling just because it's motivated by the observations that we were, uh, Sorry. Yeah. by the profiles that we showed before. Not yeah. just that, we also make sure that uh, if we average out the net energy due to supernovae over time, then even in each of the shells along Z, so this is our box, at oh. each shell we are having net energy injected due to supernovae balancing out the net cooling losses yes. because that is what we get from the observational profiles okay now so we are basically running yeah uh, then we have a parameter called fsn here which you see uh, is which defines what's the net heating rate due to sn so that basically tells us what fraction of the cooling is due to uh, is compensated by the supernova heating term yes. so that is sort of equation 5c right yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes. maybe we can 
go down now to right we can go down now to uh figure i guess we can go to figure two now yes figure two let's take a look at figure two and here's some of the sims bang bang okay right so yes so here so this is basically the fiducial set of our runs in which we vary how much energy we are putting into a smooth heating term and how much we are putting into the supernova heating term. Okay. So if we have FSN of 0 0.01, that means only 1% of the energy uh, that is lost to cooling is compensated by supernova heating okay. and the rest is put in as a smooth heating term. Okay. So we have the smooth and the discrete heating term. Whereas okay. if you look at the bottom most one, which is yep. FSN of 0.99, there are 99% of the energy that is lost due to cooling is put back into the system as supernovae. Whereas yes. only 1% is put back as the smooth heating term. Okay. So <laughs> if we want to look at, that basically are the two extremes. And then we have one in which 10% is due to supernovae. Another one in the third one, which is 50% is due to supernovae. Yes. Okay. Now the leftmost panel here shows us uh, the density Snapshots, yeah. Snapshots are density, temperature, uh, and fluctuations in density and pressure. Now, mm -hmm. as we go downward from top to bottom here, uh, let's say we look at the third panel, we see that the amplitude of these fluctuations is increasing significantly. So there are a lot more density fluctuations Indeed. when we drive supernovae, Indeed. simply because I they... These are explosions. You know, when we create explosions, they create fluctuations. Uh, and we can also see some very dense regions, uh, which uh, look like these bright blue regions uh -huh. in the uh -huh. in the bottom two panels. Uh -huh. yes. Those two. Yes. Those dense. yes, those are the filaments that are generated by supernova shocks interacting with each other and generating very dense regions. Yes. And if we look at them in the temperature plot, which is the second panel here in the there we see the same filaments having low temperature. So uh, if we uh, look at, let's say. Oh, uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, the purple yeah. regions. Okay. In the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very yes. good. So it's the Very same good. regions. Mm -hmm. They have temperatures of like 10 to the power 4 Kelvin, which basically this gas has cooled down all the way from 10 to the power 6 Kelvin to 10 to the power oh. 4 Kelvin. Okay. Uh, simply because they are very dense and they're cooling fast and oh they gosh. form these filaments. And these filaments sort of drop down because they're dense. It's like, uh, you can imagine it uh, often, if you throw a rock into water, then that rock is going to sink, Yes. right? So it's sort of what the filaments are doing. They basically sink down uh, to the bottom of the box and they exit through the bottom boundary. Yeah, very cool, good, uh-huh. Right, so yeah, these, so yeah, so these, Filaments only occur, only we only see them in the runs in which we have stronger supernovae. So basically where this FSN parameter is large. Yes. We don't see them in the upper two, which is FSN 0 0.01 and 0.1, right. because the smooth heating doesn't give rise to strong fluctuations. Yes. So we need strong fluctuations to generate dense regions because dense regions cool faster and then we can have cold gas happening in the system. Okay. Yep, yeah. cold gas and elliptical. Cool. Yes. Right. Yes. So that's that sort of yeah. Uh, that's sort of the basic idea. Uh, maybe yeah. We can go over to Figure Four now, where I can uh, talk about how some of these uh, things, how the global properties of these simulations evolve with time. Uh huh. So in the first one, we are looking at uh, mass. Uh, and so if we look at the right, yeah. So the first row, we are looking at the mass evolution, and we can see that. The uh, if we are increasing the fraction of energy we are putting into energy into supernovae, yes. then we are seeing that uh, the mass stays almost constant. If we have a smooth heating term, it's basically heating is balancing cooling all the time. There's not much motions in the gas, so the total mass in the system stays almost the same. Uh -huh. Whereas if we keep increasing the fraction of supernovae, what is happening is they are first driving some fluctuations, and then we are forming some cold gas. Uh, you can see that in the in the last panel, which is M cold by M tot, you cool. can see that yes. the fraction of cold gas increases, but yes. then it also drops because, as I said, the cold gas is exiting through the bottom of our box. Correct. Now, 
Right. So because of that, the right. mass initially shows an in decrease, right? The mass decreases a bit around that same time where the cold gas mass falls. Right. Uh, but after that, what happens is now we have less gas in our system because we have lost some, we have converted some into cold filaments yes. and they fall into the bottom of the box. Yes. So now the supernova heating rate is still fixed. So it's not changing with time. So what right. is happening now is we are putting more heat into the system, but we are having less cooling. So now what will happen is, uh, uh, what happens is basically the supernovae are going to drive a thermal wind. It's basically yes. we are overheating some region and we have gravity in one direction, right? So things will try to heat up and expand and will be driving a wind. So cool. the gas starts flowing upward in the opposite direction. So that's what happens. Uh, so there are two phases of evolution in the simulations where we have strong supernovae feedback. One is in the first supernovae shocks interact and give us cold gas and that falls through the bottom of the box. Yep. And after that happens, the net density decreases. And whenever the heating exceeds the cooling, we are going to have a thermal wind driven by the supernova. That makes sense. That makes sense. Very good. Very good. Right. And we can also see in the uh, sigma v hot, which is showing uh -huh. us the RMS velocity. Yes. Uh, so that sort of gives us an idea of what's the amplitude of turbulence that the supernovae are driving. So we can see that as we increase the fraction of energy we are putting into supernovae, the yeah. sigma v hot increases, which means the system is becoming more and more turbulent. So yes. we initially it's like five kilometers per second, whereas the uppermost ones are like 40 kilometers per second. Yes. Mm -hmm. But okay. uh, one one part that is, I guess, uh, uh, a bit difficult, I mean, this is a bit difficult to observe because we uh, these are, the ISM of these elliptical galaxies, they're uh, all emitting in uh, X-rays and in X-ray, we don't have as much spectral resolution to yeah. look at 40 kilometers per second emitting gas. And also these are very yeah. tiny regions. So a lot of averaging out can happen when we are projecting along line of sight, yeah. if we have a lot of random motions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So observing this might be a bit hard, but yeah, we do see some evidence of what might be going. Yeah. Some predictions. <laughs> right. Good. So uh, I guess we can go to the next figure, figure okay. five. Five, which is time evolutions. Yes. So here, uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, what is what is the mass budget in our system. So how much mass is leaving the box, and how much are we putting in through supernovae? And after the mass budget, I'll also briefly mention the energy budget. So if we look at the mass budget, so the first one is showing us how much mass is exiting through the upper boundary of the box. And the uh, uh, second one is showing us how much mass is exiting through the bottom boundary of the box. And oh, yeah. what okay. We, okay. we actually see a strong negative flux when, just off when we are forming multi-phase gas. So when we are forming cold gas, uh, we see a strong negative mass flux, which means a lot of mass is falling okay. down. Yeah. Whereas uh, later on, yeah, we find that the mass flux stays slightly positive, which means we are driving an upward wind, wind in the positive z direction. Yes. But if you look at how much mass is being put in through supernovae, so in addition to putting in 10 to the power 51 arcs of energy, each supernova also puts in one solar mass per event. Fair, yes. But we can see that that energy is actually a few orders of magnitude less than how much mass flux we have. So if you look at m dot out, it's yeah. like of the order of 10 to the power minus three, Whereas yeah. m dot sn is of the order of 10 to the power minus 5, which means right. supernovae don't play a big role in the mass budget. So, yeah. however, there are AGB stars which may play a bigger role in mass budget. So, the asymptotic giant branch stars shed their outer envelopes, which can get mixed with the ISM, and they may provide a mass budget. Uh, and this has been discussed in other studies. I haven't discussed it in the main part of this paper, but in yeah. the appendix, I talk about it. And the AGB stars. Uh, mm -hmm. I got one question here. Your boundaries on boundary conditions on the box or the diode of some sort? Right. So, yeah, I should have mentioned this before. So, mm -hmm. what we have here is uh, we have this cuboidal box, right? And gravity along the z direction. So, on x and y, it's pretty simple. We just put periodic boundary conditions. Fair. But along z, we cannot do that because there is gravity in one direction. So, 
there is stratification. Right. Exactly. Yeah, we cannot do mm -hmm. that. So what we do is uh, we actually use, uh, we keep the boundaries constant at the same density and pressure that we start with. Okay. And we we basically don't drive supernovae too close to the boundaries. And actually we have slightly longer box along the Z direction and we yes. sort of treat the boundary as a buffer zone. So we don't, we have like one and a half times the length uh, along the Z direction, but we only analyze the central one region. So if, okay, within boundaries. if yeah. the Z is going from minus 0. 0.75 to plus 0. 0.75, then we are only analyzing minus 0. 0.5 to plus 0. 0.5 so that we have some buffered zones right. and boundary okay. effects yeah. don't affect as much. Right. Uh, but okay. we do let, we are letting cold gas exit through the bottom boundary, but not the hot gas. Because if we let the hot gas exit, the whole, this local setup that we have, it will collapse away. And yeah, so right. that's not something we want. Okay. Right. There was a very uh, good time to ask this question because I was going to come to the, Next plot, figure six, which tells us how the mass profile or density profile evolves with time. Okay. So on the right side, we are seeing the density profile. And uh, here you see that we have three three lines. One is at t equal to zero, which is the green line. Then another, which is either when cold gas is forming or when or at, the, uh, or at 100 million years, because the smooth heating simulation never forms uh, Okay. Cold gas, so I have just shown it at 100 million years, which is sort of at a similar time. Yes, because this is in order. 0.01. This is basically yes, exactly. So the upper right. panel is 0 0.01 right. and the bottom is 0 0.99. So right. Right. smooth heating is the upper one and supernova heating is the bottom one. So what we are seeing here is the density profile almost shows no evolution for the super for the smooth heating case, which is right. FSN 0 0.01. Right. But if we have strong supernova heating, we see that there are two phases of evolution. One is when some cold gas is formed and exited the box, then the whole profile is sort of falling down slightly. Yes. So that we see between the green and the red one. So yeah. that's what has happened in the first 100 million years. Yeah. But later on, what happens is we are driving this energy-driven wind, which leads to further mass loss. Yes. Okay. So the first round of mass loss happens when cold gas forms and falls through. So the whole mass is sort of decreasing slightly. Then after that, we are driving this wind. So that is sort of taking out mass more from the upper regions. And uh, uh, so the supernovae are, we are just driving energy right. wind out, mass out. So that's how we are ending up with a very different profile at later times. Indeed. So this means that this also means that you know this local setups they're showing that the profiles of this density that we are seeing is not stable for even 500 million years. So uh, either local setup is not a very good setup to study this or our profile or there is something going on in the physics. Okay. Uh, so because, you know, the elliptical galaxies are stable for giga years, uh, multiple giga years. So this profile should not change in a few hundred million years. Yes. Right. So, okay. so okay. that is something we are addressing in future simulations. Ooh, we'll come to that. Okay. Yes, we'll come to that in the end. First, uh, we'll cover this paper. Yes. Now that we have talked about mass budget, we can move on to energy budget. So, which is figure seven. Uh, figure seven, let's get some energy rolling sources, sinks, and boundary fluxes. Yes. So, here we go. Time evolution. Yes. Energy outflows. Okay. Let me just zoom out a little bit there. There we go. All right. So, here in the first panel, we are looking at how much energy is flowing out through the boundaries. Okay. So, we have the upper, these are the Z boundaries, upper and lower Z boundaries of the box. And then we have, we are looking at uh, how much among these, uh, also we are putting in energy into supernovae and we are losing some energy through cooling. Yes. And also we have the smooth heating term. Yes. Okay. And these are shown for like four different, uh, uh, the four different simulations. Maybe we can just focus on the FSN 0 0.01 and FSN 0 0.99. Okay. to see the big difference uh, between the two, which shows us the biggest contrast. Mm, so, indeed. so if we look at the outflow from the boundaries, we see that FSN 0 0.01 is the light green color. Mm -hmm. It's showing us almost no outflow because it's a very smooth heating term. The profiles don't change much. We are not overheating the system. There's no wind. Right. But if we look at the 99% supernovae, we are seeing a super strong wind that is uh, of the order of 0 0.01 per million years. So these are normalized by that total initial energy. 
just to give us a time scale. Uh, right. And if we look at how much energy is being put in through supernovae, we see that the energy that is outflowing through the boundary is almost the same as the energy that is being put in by supernovae. If we look at the second panel, the dark green one, yeah. we see that uh, yeah. most of the energy that we're putting into supernovae, it's sort of half of it or even more than half of it is going into this outflow. So it's basically yeah. telling us this energy is sort of driving a thermal wind. Mm -hmm. that, and, but this only happens after the cold gas sort of forms and falls down. So oh. we don't find this match uh, at like the very early time. So if you see in the first 100 million years, this match is not there. And there's a very good reason why. The answer to that is actually the third panel where we are showing the cooling rate. Mm. So the cooling rate you see is like mm. also at 0 0.01 at initial times. And it is sort of balancing uh, the, the supernova heating in the beginning. So that's why heating and cooling are balanced. So we are not having energy excess or energy loss. So right. uh, there is no wind, right? But after we form cold gas and yes. that falls through, so now you see the cool cooling rate has dropped down by an order of magnitude, 10 to the yes. power minus three. Yes. So now we are not having enough cooling losses, but we are heating at the same rate. So the supernova right. heating is roughly the same. Yep. Right. So oh. because of this overheating, we drive the thermal wind. So if the heating and cooling were always balanced, this this issue won't be there. So this is also something to think about uh, in elliptical galaxies. If the heating and cooling are balanced, then the wind will be much weaker. Whereas if we have cooling is, let's say, an order of magnitude less than heating, then all the energy will be basically spent in trying to drive the uh, energy uh, thermal wind. Yes, very cool. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Maybe, right. Now we can uh, sort of have a quick look at uh, equations, uh, the equations 7 C, D, E, so, mm -hmm. and 7 G, H, I. Okay. So there's A, B, and let's go. I think we're down. Here we go. Equation 7 C. Right. So yeah, so the total outflow is we are basically now integrating the energy in different shells. So which is integrate if this is our z direction, we are integrating in x and y. Mm. So we are looking at what energy is going in outflow. So yeah. this is you know there is kinetic energy, and then we have the uh, thermal energy plus we also have a work done. So that gives us a gamma by gamma minus one. Uh -huh. uh, so work done is just PdV, right? So Correct. yes. And then we are multiplying it with rho vz. So that sort of, this is basically giving us the uh, out, energy outflow rate. Now we have the supernova energy, uh, which is sort of self-explanatory, how much energy is going into supernovae. Then we have the cooling rate, which is n square cooling function. Yes, right? square gamma. Now, yeah. mm -hmm. now on the right-hand side, we are looking at, we are trying to break this into different components. Okay, this outflow energy, we are trying to break into different components. One is the wind component. So oh, if good. let's say the entire thing had a mean velocity of Vz, okay, so uh, then what are the different components? We can have a kinetic energy component sure. and the thermal plus work done energy component. So this is, if there are no fluctuations and everything is just a constant energy wind that is going out, but if we have fluctuations, you can also have convection and uh, waves, which can also carry away some of the energy. So convection is given by equation 7H, where we have this delta Vz times delta T term, or delta N times delta T term. Yes. So, but this... Yes. So convection basically happens when we are trying to invert the entropy gradient. Or I mean, it's, it's sort of what happens, let's say, if you're heating water and we are heating it from the bottom, then the bottom part becomes hot and it tries to rise up to the top. So that is essentially convection. So hotter things at the bottom trying to rise up or higher entropy things uh, yeah, rising up, uh, and, uh, inverting. The, so that is what is convection. So supernovae can cause convection because a lot of the energy is actually depo being deposited in the central regions, which are overheating those areas. Uh -huh. And because those areas are hot, this cavity, the bubbles are sort of rising up. So that is sort of convection. So that is one of the mechanisms through a supernovae can transfer the energy. Yes. Okay. 
So now we now that we have introduced these equations, we can go to figure eight, which shows us how these uh, energy injection by supernovae look at different times. So maybe we can zoom in a bit so that uh, yes, that looks good. So if you look at the upper panel, so the red here, uh, so this is a Z profile. So the x-axis is Z. And on the y-axis, we are normalizing the different flux components by the two mean energy we are putting into the supernova. Mm, fair. OK. Mm -hmm. OK. So now we are first looking at the outflow. And you see, the first one is at 90 million years. And this is for the 50% supernova heating. We just chose this as a representative run. but if we look at the 99% supernova heating, that also looks somewhat similar. Okay. So this is just a representative plot. Now, uh, we can see that there are two quantities, which, uh, so yeah, the net, net energy flux is basically this E dot out. Now we are trying to figure out what are the different components of components it. Components of that. Now, right. there are two main components. One is this dark blue one, which is sort of always positive, And that is our E dot convection in the rightmost mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you can see that is almost always positive, and it's of the magnitude of around 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 0.4. It's mm -hmm. sort of in between that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then we have the blue dash dotted one, which is the thermal wind energy. Yeah. So, so yeah. that is basically uh, what we had in uh, equation 7G. If we just uh, quickly go back in the, uh, to equation 7G, yeah. It's basically in the previous page. Uh, yes, on the bottom right of the previous page. Yes, so that's the thermal wind component. So we have E dot wind equal to this equation and that's the thermal uh, wind component. Uh, so these are the two major things. So one is basically we have the hot gas just flowing, that's the thermal wind, but we also have convection and we see that both of them are important uh, at uh, early times. Uh, uh, so, but at later times, when we look at t equal to 500 million years, yeah. we see that uh, the E dot out, which is the red curve, and the, which is the total energy in this outflow, is almost entirely composed of this thermal wind component. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that is because by now the medium itself has become hot. So it's basically if you are thinking of uh, heating boiling water and yeah. you're, all of the water is already boiling, so you're not going to drive strong convection okay. yeah. so yeah so that's why the convection becomes weaker at later times and most of the energy is just in this uh, thermal wind phase so this is another uh, confirmation of the fact that supernovae are driving a thermal wind so initially there is some convection but after we have heated the medium the convection is a bit weaker okay very good i'm with you beautiful all right so maybe we can Skip a couple of, uh, yes, maybe we can first go back to uh, uh, equation. Uh, I'll uh, right. I'll tell you which equation. We'll go back to the time scales equations, and it's on page five. Yeah, we so it's on the right yeah, side of page started, five. We start off with some time scales, so yeah, let's go to there. Mm -hmm. Okay, five. Yes, scale. yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So here we have uh, some uh, very important time scales, which sort of determine whether co how cold gas forms. So now we have seen some of the global properties. Now we'll move our focus to how cold gas forms in these sort of systems. Okay. Now one important thing is the cooling time, yes, which is the ratio of uh, you know the uh, internal energy to the cooling rate. That's what we have here, and uh, we have another thing which is sort of the thermal instability time scale that is very related to the cooling time here, it's just gamma times T cool. It depends a bit on the exact model of the heating. So it's just the growth rate of uh, thermal instability or how fast we are having a cold clump yeah, fall, yeah. let's say, for in simple terms. Now, in addition to that, we also have a free fall time, which is equation 6C, slightly above, mm -hmm. uh, right? Oh, there we so go. that is basically, you know, free fall time is... Uh, square root of 2 h by g. It's basically if the scale height of a system is h and awesome. we are dropping something, how fast a thing falls freely yes. to a particular scale height. Okay, So if we drop right. a ball, it's falling in that time scale. Now, okay. the idea of why these two time scales are important is uh, if, if a system has very uh, strong gravity, it sort of inhibits cold gas from forming. So this is 
something that was discussed in uh, Pratik Sharma's paper in 2012, I think, uh, or I think even in 2010 paper that discussed this. And also it has been discussed in theory by Mark Poit uh, uh, and others. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is uh, this is some one important time scale which tells the ratio between these two time scales tells us when uh, a certain region of dense gas can go on to form these cold filaments. Okay, so that is uh, if a region has very short cooling time, okay, then it will try to cool very fast. But if you have very strong gravity that tries to prevent these regions from becoming unstable, so what gravity will try to do is it will try to push these cooling clumps into some, you know, uh, into an equilibrium. Uh, if gravity is strong, it will try to force them into some new equilibrium. But if it is not strong enough, then they will keep on cooling fast and they will uh, uh, basically cool all the way to form like 10 to the power 4 Kelvin gas, which is very cold filaments right. from right. when we are starting at 10 to the power 6 or 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. So uh, it's sort of a contest between these two. Now, there is another important time scale, which is the mixing time scale, which uh -huh. is equation 6b. Yes. And it's the mixing due to turbulence. So if we have some dense region that is cooling, again, um, one thing was gravity can push this dense region back into equilibrium if the gravity is strong enough. Another thing that can happen is um, if you have strong turbulence, that can mix dense region with the surrounding. Yes. Okay? And it can basically smear out whatever fluctuation we had. It's uh, basically you, you know, we... Oh. Turbulence leads to faster mixing, right? Just like when you are stirring cream into your coffee, you mix, stir it, and things get mixed faster. So turbulence can mix things as well. Yes, you have your coffee. There. I, I just don't have any cream in it, but I get it. Yeah, right. yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, turbulence leads to faster mixing. And uh, so mm -hmm. that is another way we can stop the formation of uh, cold gas by mixing it quickly with the surrounding. So if the mixing time is short or if turbulence is strong enough that it is mixing very quickly, right. then we can stop cold gas from forming. Right. Yes. Yes. So these are the two things uh, that are sort of important. And maybe now we can go to figure uh, yeah. figure 11. Okay. So pre-fall, presumably we're going to look at some of those right now. Figure 11, 8, 9, 10, mm -hmm. and 11. Right. So here I'm just showing TTI by T free fall, which is, you know, the, you can think of this as cooling to free fall ratio. Yes. So free fall is short. If, uh, if gravity is strong, then free fall will be short and the whole ratio will be larger. Okay. Now, if cooling time is short, that means this ratio will be smaller. Okay. Yeah. Now we start all four simulations with roughly the same parameters. We start with some white noise. So on yeah. the X axis here, we have amplitude of density fluctuations. Now, why are density fluctuations important? You may ask. That's because if we have strong density fluctuations, then we can have, you know, imagine we have density uh, being all the same. But if we have strong fluctuations, we will have very high density regions, yeah. basically strong clumps, and these clumps cool very fast. Uh -huh. okay. So uh -huh. that's why, even though the mean density may be the same, if the, we have strong fluctuations, then we can have very strong high density regions, which can okay. cool fast. So yeah. that affects the cooling time. Okay. So that's why density fluctuations are important, but uh, uh, almost as important as you know whatever the mean density is. Okay, so that's that's why we are plotting this versus me uh, the density fluctuations. Now, these uh, uncolored, unfilled points that we see uh, close to uh, you know point two sigma s equal to point two on the x-axis. So if you mm -hmm. see, there are like four points a bit to your right. They're uncolored, uh, so in the gray region of the plot. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. okay. Yes, gonna... yes. So those four points. Uh, yeah. So we see four points: a diamond, a square, a cross, uh, and a triangle. So these are for our four different runs, and we start them all with sigma s around 0.2. Okay. Okay. But with okay. time, they evolve differently. So these dashed lines of different colors that we see that is showing how these four yep. different runs. Are evolving differently. Okay, I'm with you. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So if we if you follow the diamond, uh, let's say it starts with sigma is close to 0.2, then the density fluctuation decreases, and then it fluctuates a bit before it sort of reaches a steady state around sigma is slightly larger than 0.1. So that's the pink line that we are seeing. If we yes. follow the pink right. line, yes, and then right. we reach the diamond at the end. So that's sort yeah. of so showing the evolution of uh, 
how this density fluctuations change with time and that's how and uh, and right and uh, if we remember from uh, before uh, uh, in the very first uh, you know the 2d slices that i showed this point uh -huh. one run was not forming multi phase gas there was no cold right. gas in this system right. everything was hot so right. here what i'm indicating is there are two parts of this plot we can sort of divide this into a single phase region and a multi phase region Excellent. so yes and if if a simulation is forming cold gas, I show the final state as a filled filled marker. So those okay. are the blue and the green, dark blue and the green one. You see that filled. Whereas yeah. if they never form cold gas, I show them as an unfilled marker. Okay. So that's the triangle and the diamond. Uh -huh. right? So they are unfilled. So if you follow the green triangle as well, the FS and 0 0.01, you see that uh -huh. it starts out close to sigma is 0.2. It's actually a bit, uh, yeah. And then it moves leftward. So yes. it's uh, so it starts from that. Uh, you know, it's actually below the square in the sigma is 0.2 region. Yes, mm -hmm. over there, it's actually right. hidden below that because they all started at the same initial condition, and it moves leftward, which means the amplitude of fluctuations is decreasing over time, and mm -hmm. then it reaches a steady state where we have very small amplitude of fluctuations. Yes, right. Now yeah. it yeah. evolves leftward and it sort of settles down there. Then if we follow the pink diamond, let's say the diamond sort of starts at a similar location, it moves and it settles down at a slightly uh, larger sigma s, right? Yeah. Uh, the amplitude of fluctuation is slightly larger. That's because we are driving more supernovae. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. cool. If you're putting more supernovae, the amplitude of fluctuation is increasing. And if you are going to, let's say now the blue, blue uh, cross uh -huh. yeah so that that is now started uh, evolving rightward so the fluctuations is now increasing with time right? right okay and if we go to the green square that shows yeah. even stronger increase in amplitude of fluctuations yeah yeah very cool now be, now this is basically what tells us is that so in theory what we had is that uh, so there was this theory proposed by mark Voigt, but also uh, Prakriti Pal Chudri had done some work on this before. They were saying that this threshold ratio of TTR by T free fall okay. for which we form cold gas, okay, so should depend on the amplitude of fluctuations. So it basically means that if we have very strong density fluctuations, we are more likely to form cold gas. Yeah. Uh, for the same value of TTI by T free fall. Okay, whatever. Okay. You put to that, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. So this uh, ratio on the left side, even though its value may be the same, we require a larger threshold value. So because you know, if you have a shorter cooling time, that's trying to make more cold gas. But if we have a uh, shorter freefall time, that's trying to stop the cold gas from forming. Yes. Yes. Uh, Competition. So the ratio between the two is important. Yeah. Uh, and if we have stronger oh. amplitude of fluctuations. You know, local regions can be very dense. So if we have very strong fluctuations, we will have very dense regions which can oh. cool faster yeah. and uh, give us cold gas. So what we are seeing is, depending on whether we put smooth heating or we put strong supernova heating, we end up forming uh, uh, cold gas or we don't end up forming cold gas. And that basically is because uh, the supernovae are driving density fluctuations in the medium. Yes. So that's what we are showing along this. That's why they are very different along the x-axis of this plot. Mm -hmm. uh, so the depending on how much supernova we put in, heating we put in, we have different amplitude of fluctuations. Very nice. That's a beautiful plot. Beautiful plot. Yes. Very cool. Right. So maybe now we can go to a slightly later figure, which is uh, figure 13. Figure 13. So awesome. I will focus on the second and third panel here. Uh, okay. Okay, so we can zoom in. A bit I'll zoom in on those two, second and third. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here the x-axis is the same. It's the amplitude of density fluctuations. Yes. And we are again showing almost the same thing uh, here, just that we are showing all 16 of our simulations. So we did different simulations with different strengths of gravity, Okay. Different uh, initial density, uh, yeah. different uh, with some with uh, stronger gravity, yeah, some with uh, yeah. weaker gravity. So we try to vary both this TTI and T free fall at initial times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we try to see what's the impact. Yeah. And one interesting thing we found is uh, so if we look at this uh, second one, yeah, the sorry, the 
in this case, the top one, it's the panel, is the second panel of the figure, but it's the top one of the one that we are seeing here. now. Correct. So we have this, we, we, what we found, if we just focus on the colored uh, symbols, so the red, the purple, all of the colored symbols, we can mm. see that all the colored ones are lying below this dash dotted line or the gray are all lying in the gray region. Yeah. Right? All the colored points are in the gray region, where it, which are filled. All the colored points which are filled are in the gray region and all the unfilled points are in the white region. Uh, yes, so, sir. so unfilled color. Yeah, so the, the scheme that I'm following here is that if a simulation is forming cold gas, I sort of fill in color in that. So that's the notion that I use to show. And uh, all the unfilled ones are sort of lying, uh, are basically, they never form cold gas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and you see that they're sort of nicely separated into these two different regions of this, yeah. which uh, depends on the cooling time to free fall time ratio yeah. and the amplitude of fluctuations. And, uh, and, you know, we are driving turbulence very naturally using supernovae, which is, uh, and... Uh, that sort of uh, shows how powerful this tool is to yeah. tell us whether we are forming cold gas in a system or not. And we are able to separate our different simulations into different regions simply on the basis of cooling time to free fall time yes. and the amplitude of fluctuations. Yes. So we also try to do the same thing for the cooling time to mixing time ratio. So everything in the, bot in the bottom plot here is similar, except in the denominator, you see instead of TFF, we have T-mix. So the y so if you look at the y level uh, on the bottom plot, mm -hmm. so we have minimum of TTR by T mix uh, instead of T free fall, which we are plotting here. So here we are looking at the role of turbulent mixing instead of the gravity role played by gravity. Yes. And here what we see is uh, if we try to look at points above the solid line versus points below, most of the points below are all filled except this yellow one, which right, is right yellow circle. So yeah. that one never forms cold gas, but it still lies below. So there is uh, only one simulation for which this parameter didn't predict properly whether it will form cold gas or not, but for all the other simulations, it predicted quite well. So this is also, I think, an equally, almost equally good parameter to predict whether we are going to form cold gas or not uh, using supernova driving. And we have some discussion regarding why that happens. It's actually yeah. because uh, we have, uh, I let me see, because in that simulation, I think we had strong gravity. So it, it had very strong gravity in that system. So I think that is our FSN 0.99 X3 run, which yeah. had strong gravity. So that's yeah. why the free fall time was uh, much, much, much smaller. So it was playing a stronger role in determining whether we are forming cold gas or not. So uh, both free fall time and mixing time are important. But, just that in this particular simulation, the free fall time was more important. So that's why if we just consider the mixing time, we are unable to predict uh, properly whether we are forming good. cold gas or not. Good. Awesome. So, yes. So now uh, we also looked at, uh, let's say, what if you know there are these two parameters, free fall time and mixing time? What if we look at both of them together? Can we construct a parameter that can help us do that? So that's what we did in the last one here, the last panel. If we scroll down a bit to the fourth yeah. panel. Here we go, yes. Okay. So here you see in the denominator, now the numerator is, stays the same, but in the denominator, I have minimum of the T free minimum. fall or the T mix. Okay. So if T free fall is shorter, we'll take that in the denominator. Or if T mix is shorter, we'll take that in the denominator. Now yeah. this helps us take into account these two different time scales which can, you know, mix the, or prevent uh, cold gas from forming. Okay, so yeah. both of these parameters are important. So yeah. the mixing, mixing mix, mixes the dense regions with the rarer regions, prevents cold gas from forming, whereas the free fall time sort of prevents strong uh, uh, cooling, the cooling modes from growing much, okay? So both are important. Now we'll try to again see if we can separate the, we can construct a solid line which can try to separate the simulations into two parts, okay? Mm -hmm. the, now we'll look at the colored filled points and we see mm -hmm. most of them are either lying on the line, on the solid line, or they're below the solid line, which is yeah. our multi-phase region of the plot. Correct. And all the unfilled colored points uh -huh. are lying in, above that in the white region of the plot. 
So this joint ratio seems to do relatively well of yeah. separating things into yeah. uh, multi-phase and single-phase regions. So yeah. Yeah. this essentially yeah. tells us that both three-fold time and mixing time are important in inhibiting uh, multi-phase condensation. And uh, depending on the ratio between the two and the amplitude of the fluctuations, which is what is we have on the x-axis. Axis, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we can determine whether you know the supernovae uh, are going to gen lead to have multi-phase gas or they will never have multi-phase gas in the right. system. Cool. Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was sort of the last plot of the paper. Now maybe we can move on to the appendix. Okay. And we do got a short appendix here on EGB winds. Yes. So, uh, right. Now, so yeah, what are, what are basically, why are EGB winds important? Uh, now, what EGB winds are is basically, you know, stars on the asymptotic giant branch shed part of their envelopes in, and then these envelopes of the stars get mixed with the ISM of the elliptical galaxies. Okay. And in those elliptical galaxies, these stars actually have very large velocities. They, they have like velocities of like 300 kilometers per second. They're just buzzing around uh, in the, so you can think of this as the Milky Way's bulge as well. So right. it's basically right. elliptical galaxies are, you know, right. uh, they basically have stars just buzzing around. Okay, so, and they have, and if you are shading that material that will try to thermalize in the ISM of the elliptical galaxy, yeah. which means it will, it can also contribute to heating the ISM but also, it also increases the amount of mass that is there in the ISM. Right. Yes. Right. So, so if we look at the top left figure in this appendix, okay. we see that. Uh, so yes, the top left figure shows us that the net mass in our system is actually larger when we include AGB winds. So the brown dashed line here shows us the run with AGB winds. And uh, this is all 99% supernova heating. And the right. dotted line shows us the run without AGB winds. So oh. we are basically, the AGB starts are shedding material into the ISM. So that increases the amount of mass we have. But it doesn't seem to affect the other properties of the simulations as much yeah. in these local simulations. Yes. But we have some, you know, uh, I guess I can give us some pre updates of the next paper that we are sort of working on. We'll get in there. that we are. Yes, so in that we are seeing that AGB winds do have uh, an important impact, uh, mm -hmm. but I guess I'll say stay tuned for when that comes out. <laughs> Very good. Yes, so uh, yeah, AGB winds uh, do increase the mass and they affect the energy budget slightly. They lead to larger amounts of cold gas production. If you look at the bottom right plot, we see that uh, we have a longer tail in the brown case of this. Yeah. Uh, as you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we have more cold gas at later times. So sure. these are time evolution plots. Okay. Good. Right. And uh, that's basically uh, because we have more mass in the system, we can keep forming more cold gas uh, till the cooling drops enough that we don't have enough gas left. Cool. So uh, otherwise, other properties are sort of similar. Now, AGB winds, yeah, they add mass and energy both to the system, but yeah. energy-wise, they don't seem to be as important. But mass-wise, they seem to be quite important because we see they're affecting uh, the mass quite yeah. a bit and right. the cold gas mass, but the energy-wise, they don't seem to be as important. Sure. Cool. Very cool. Yes. Yeah, yeah that was... That is more or less, yeah, I went through the important parts of the paper, but there are also a few other figures which I skipped through. So, yeah, I think uh, yeah. yeah, this was the sense of it. Very cool, very cool. Raj Sekhar, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very awesome article on gas and ellipticals. Very nicely done. Thank you, Frank. Uh, sure. And it's a pleasure chatting with you. Sure. Well, we're not done yet. I'm, I'm going to grill you next. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, and you hinted at it a couple of times uh, as we went through. Uh, and so let me let me push on it a little bit and ask, you know, where do you think we go from here, uh, given the published article? Um, you know, are there, I mean, clearly there's always more simulations to do. <laughs> uh, but uh, just sort of next steps, where do you think we go with this? Um, right. 
So one of the things I mentioned uh, quite a few times is we had two phases in the simulation, one in which we are forming cold gas uh -huh. and another in which we are driving a thermal wind, right? Yes. Uh, now, the thermal wind part, I don't think the local simulations are a very good answer to that. Uh, so it's you, it's actually important to do global models of the elliptical galaxy okay. uh, so that we can capture the geometry properly. You know, elliptical galaxy, we can, they have more spherical geometry rather than, you know, the small patch that we chose box, in the sky. Right. Right. A little box doesn't capture, you know, how right. the energy is sort box of expanding and flowing. So yeah, little box is not very good at that. So we have been doing some simulations cool. in which we are modeling sort of the entire inner region of the elliptical galaxy. Right. Uh, and we are doing like different sizes of the regions. We are doing something that is 40 kiloparsec size, or we zoom in into the very center, like one kiloparsec cube size, okay. the very center. Yeah, so we, we do like multiple sets of zoom-ins. We see, nice. we are again looking at the impact of supernovae, the impact of AGB winds, uh, what if we increase the black hole mass a bit? Uh, how does that affect things yeah. uh, in the right. center of the elliptical galaxy? Because that affects the gravity. Uh, and uh, if we change uh, yeah, how the uh, stellar profile is, how the stars are distributed at different mm -hmm. degrees, how does that affect things? Because Ooh, yeah, it's very profiles, so, right? Exactly, because stars affect how much supernovae are there and how many AGB stars are there. So yeah, all of those things. So. I think uh, I am quite looking forward to uh, sharing those results uh, sometime in the future. Uh, but yeah, we are doing that. Uh, and in addition to that, yeah, um, observations-wise, it um, we did calculate what's uh, the size of these remnants. And because they are generating these large yes. fluctuations, can we actually see them in the right. elliptical galaxies? Yes. Uh, because the fluctuations can be as high as 20, 30, 40%. Uh, yeah. So it may be possible to see them, but there are a few things we have to be careful about because these are of size around 50 parsec to 100 parsecs in size. And we are integrating through something that is hundreds of kiloparsec, right. up to 100 kiloparsec. Maybe uh -huh. in the center dense regions are like a few tens of kiloparsec, but we are integrating through a very large volume. So the fluctuations may average out, wow. but we may be able to find them out through clumping. But I was also told by X-ray astronomers that we need to be careful about uh, X-ray binaries in these systems because they also will lead to fluctuations. Yeah. There are things that, as a theorist, okay. I don't consider as often. Okay. So, okay. Well, that'll be exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that will be exciting. And the thing is, uh, right now, the, the size that we are looking at of the remnants is smaller than the resolution limit of Chandra, even for... Uh, let's say the Virgo cluster, which is one of the nearest ones. Yeah. Uh, but if we have future X-ray missions, which are going to have better spatial resolution, fingers crossed, yes, uh, they might be able to resolve these remnants and cool. uh, we may be able to get more information out of that. Validation. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, it'll be really exciting to see this develop over the next couple of years from the additional simulations to crossing fingers about um, high resolution X-ray observations. Very cool. Yeah. Very nice. Another thing we can also look at is how metals are transported from the centers of these elliptical galaxies Ooh. to slightly outer regions Ooh. because, you know, the I'm talking about the wind here, right? So the yeah, wind yeah. can transfer uh, metals uh, and, you know, the supernovae themselves inject metals into the ISM and they can also be transported uh, outwards. Uh, AGB stars also contain evolved material, uh, which is at different metallicities. So all of these can also play a role in how the metallicity gradients look like in elliptical exactly. galaxies. Exactly, yes, mm -hmm. exactly, very cool, very cool. Well, it'll be really fun to see this develop. Raj Lekar, I wanna thank you so much again for walking us through your very awesome article. Thank you. Thank you. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.